Welcome back to um, the U of T Grand Round. We took a break last week for the Sally Lesson meeting in Ottawa, uh, which many of you were at. It was a great meeting. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from uh, a local but also international expert, uh, Dr. Steve Archinoff, who is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's been a wonderful asset to, to our department, but he goes around the world speaking as well. So it's always nice to have uh, experts who are internationally recognized but global, uh, locally available to us. Uh, Steve's long been a leading researcher, both in the areas of OVD devices, as well as intracameral antibiotics following cataract surgery, which I think is a real, um, which has been a real bonus to, to, our, to our profession. He's long been a leading voice for, for simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery, and I'm sure we'll hear about some of that today. Uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Arshanoff maintains a busy cataract practice in Toronto. He's the director of the IVAN, which is an amazing project so that services rural Ontario, and is also, he also founded the Eye Foundation of Canada, um, a program from which many ophthalmologists um, launched their career. So, Steve, thank you for everything that you do for ophthalmology, both locally and internationally, and I look forward to hearing your talks today. I'd also like to welcome two of our senior residents, fifth-year residents, uh, Dr. Ellen Zhao and Dr. Marco Popovich, who will be joining uh, Steve in the presentations this morning. So guys, thank you, Mandy. Um, so Marco's first. Great. So I'll just share my slides here. All right, excellent. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rai, for the, the warm introduction, and, and thank you, Dr. Arshinov, for, for all your help and, and support in preparing this presentation. So the first topic we wanted to address um, in today's Grand Rounds was on the topic of femtosecond lasers and their role in cataract surgery. And so we know that with routine FACO, this has become such a streamlined process. Um, you know, there, there's a focus in, in our residency training on, on learning FACO and, you know, overwhelmingly patients do quite well and, and are happy after the standard uh, manual cataract surgery. Though we know that there, there are, uh, you know, difficult cases and cases in which you wish you almost had some help. And so the, there's a question of, could we automate some of the, the um, uh, steps along the cataract surgery way to make the surgery overall safer and easier. And so this was really the impetus for um, bringing in femtosecond lasers uh, uh, as an adjunct to, to uh, cataract surgery. And so femtosecond lasers can be used um, through many steps of the, the procedure from starting with the uh, uh, main incision that you make to designing a, a capsulotomy um, so that you don't have to do a, a manual capsulorexis to, to then fragmenting the uh, uh, various parts of the lens to allow for a, a smoother uh, and more controlled nuclear disassembly. And so before I get into the, um, you know, some of the points on the presentation, I just wanted to pull the audience and see right now what the use of femtosecond lasers in cataract uh, surgery has been. So I'll just read out the question. Um, of all, so let's just see here. Of all cataract surgeries performed, what proportion of the time do you use femtosecond lasers to assist with surgery? Is it 80 to 100%? 60 to 80%, 40 to 60%, 20 to 40%, or zero to 20%. So we'll just wait some time for- people. Uh, We've got some pretty good results in here already, so I'll share that with you. The majority of your audience is less than 20%, it looks like Marco. Right, exactly. And, and you know, that, that could be expected given, um, you know, given what we've heard, but I'll go into the issues and I'll try to be kind of as balanced as I can on both sides of the argument. And so you know, femtosecond lasers, as we know, um, what they, what they do is they use the phenomenon of photo disruption. So they, there's a creation of ionized electrons that allow for, um, that allow for shock, shock waves that, are, that can mechanically um, uh, break the tissue, whether that's at the level of the anterior capsule or the lens itself. And they're accompanied with use of, of uh, real-time intraoperative OCT. I went into the different um, parts of the procedure that femtosecond lasers can assist with, but they also can assist uh, with astigmatism management in terms of arcuate keratotomies. And so, you know, on the pro side of this argument, the, uh, you know, what, what the companies would say and those who are proponents of femtosecond lasers, they would say that it allows for more surgical reproducibility. The, you know, the capsulotomies are circular, they're centered, um, you know, it, it allows for improved efficacy of the procedure, um, uh, you know, visual outcomes and refractive outcomes of patients are overall better and it allows for improved sa safety because complications are lower. On the other side of the, the coin, um, those who you know, may have not adopted femtosecond lasers cite the high patient cost, especially when considering that you know, the evidence has really shown no difference in terms of efficacy and safety uh, between femtosecond laser cataract surgery and manual cataract surgery, as well as potentially an inconvenience you know, of getting a patient into the 
uh, femtosecond laser suite and then moving them over to the operating microscope to complete the procedure. And so I'll go into a, a few uh, salient points of literature, uh, starting with a meta-analysis that I was uh, fortunate to be involved with back in 2016, look, comparing femtosecond lasers with uh, manual cataract surgery. So we searched three major databases and included observational studies and, and uh, randomized control trials uh, that compared these two techniques and overall included 15 randomized trials and, and 22 observational studies and uh, just over 14,000 eyes. And so you know, going into the goals of, of uh, the femtosecond laser technology, as I mentioned earlier, the first is really to try to improve uh, visual and, and refractive outcomes. And, and what we saw in our meta-analysis was that this was really just not borne out by the evidence. So these were overall, you know, most of these cases were routine cases. And we found in that sample that there was really no difference in terms of, uh, you know, corrected, uncorrected uh, distance visual acuity or mean absolute error. Um, and other measures of refractive predictability. And, and so we know that there are sources of error in refractive predictability, including the, you know, the type of femtosecond uh, uh, laser machine you use, the, you know, which, which stages of the, of the procedure you're using it in, what, what type of uh, manual cataract set, setup you have, you know, the surgeon, the institution, there are many different, uh, you know, the follow-up time, there are many different sources which may, which may pose variability when trying to evaluate this research question. The second goal is, well, you know, the proponents would say that femtosecond laser cataract surgery is superior in terms of secondary surgical endpoints. And so, you know, in general, there were some mixed results, but we did find that in general, um, with, with using the laser, the, the capsulotomies were more circular, as, as you would expect, um, and there was less decentration of the, uh, of the IOL relative to the, um, the center of the pupil. Uh, we also found that, that femtosecond laser cataract surgery had a... Uh, a lower deviation from what the intended capsular diameter uh, was going to be. And then in terms of the third goal um, is to improve safety uh, and, and to reduce complications. And so we looked at a whole host of different complications for this. And in general, we found no difference between uh, the two procedures. The, the one interesting finding was that we did find a significantly greater rate of PC tears following uh, femtosecond laser cataract surgery. And you know, one of the explanations could be that, that in this pro process of photo disruption, as you see in the, the picture here, um, you know, there's, there are many bubbles that are, that are uh, formed during the procedure. And so you know, as we're learning uh, femtosecond laser cataract surgery, we're always taught to, before we kind of proceed with our FACO, to, to really make sure that we're evacuating all of these bubbles um, after the after the femtosecond laser has been applied, because if you don't, it can really increase that uh, intracapsular pressure, and and if you kind of hydrodissect, um, you know, liberally with with a lot of bubbles uh, being there, that that might you know pop the bag. Uh, we also did find a, a greater concentration of prostaglandins following uh, femtosecond laser cataract surgery, though that was not really associated with any uh, specific um, surgical complication. And so then the question became, well, you know, this was back in 2016, the femtosecond lasers were just coming out, people were, were learning the technology, and you were really comparing, you know, those who were, who were kind of learning uh, femtosecond lasers to, you know, seasoned uh, manual cataract surgeons, and, and maybe it wasn't a fair comparison. And so this was an updated uh, meta-analysis done more recently, uh, published in the JCRS in 2020. And I'll just go over their, their abstract here. So, you know, they, they included uh, more eyes, so, you know, 24,000 in, in, in total and 73 studies. And, you know, they mentioned in their results in eyes treated with flax, uh, they found that, you know, the visual acuity and spherical equivalent uh, were better with, with flax. They found that the uh, effective FACO time was less, the, the cumulative dissipated energy was less, uh, central corneal thickness, endothelial cell loss, et cetera. So essentially they, what they reported in the abstract here is that, that you know, on a statistical basis, uh, many of these endpoints favored flax. But when you, when you look under the hood, you know, the, the absolute differences that were seen here were actually fairly small. So, you know, just to give some examples, like with the corrected distance visual acuity, uh, what they're reporting here, the, the, with a P of 0 0.04, they found only a 0 0.01 logmar difference between these uh, two techniques in terms of CDVA. And so we know that 0 0.1 logmar is about a line of Snell and visual acuity. And so, you know, you can ask yourself, well, you know, yes, it may be statistically significant, but how clinically relevant is that to our practice? And, you know, the same story for, for CDE was about uh, two points less with, with femtosecond lasers. Um, refractive outcomes were, you know, spherical equivalent was, was on the order of like 0 0.05 diopters different between the two uh, procedures. And so, you know, that might then beg the question, well, you know, why should I ever use flax? Is there a role for flax at all, given given this uh, evidence that's been presented? And I want to go into a paper with with that uh, Dr. Arshinov and his team 
did looking at a retrospective case series of over 3000 cases comparing these uh, techniques. And, you know, one thing that was novel in this study was that they didn't look at all comers in all cases, like as I showed you in the previous meta-analyses, but they uh, stratified their cases based on surgical difficulty. And so they, they looked at all different um, ways that, that cases could be difficult and assigned uh, each case a series of, of scores and points. And then in their results on the left-hand side here with the total sample of 3000, the results were fairly similar to, to what I was uh, describing in the meta-analysis with not, not a huge great deal of difference in terms of visual and refractive outcomes. But then when you look on the right-hand side here uh, on the subgroup where this degree of difficulty was greater than zero, so there was at least one point of degree of difficulty, we do start to see some differences between um, manual and femtosecond laser cataract surgery. So, uh, you know, for, for final BCBA, for example, a 0 0.05 uh, logmar uh, difference, and for mean absolute error, a difference of about uh, 0 0.13 uh, diopters on average. And similar story with the uh, surgical time. So finding that that uh, the surgical time was less with, with femtosecond lasers versus manual cataract surgery. And so I, I want to stop it there uh, for to entertain some discussion. And so, you know, the question is, should should femtosecond lasers be used in cataract surgery? Should, it be, should they be used for all cases? Should they only be used in certain situations? Or should we never use them at all? And so I will uh, stop sharing there. OK, so OK, thanks very much. Uh, let me just show the slides that I have, and then we can uh, discuss things. Okay, so can you see it? Hope so. All right, so yeah. I'm going to tell you that uh, thanks to that discussion, Marco, I'm probably the only one here who was first taught to do cataract surgery as intracapsular cataract surgery. And I've been through every iteration of change you can possibly imagine, as every few years I was told to change my practice. And when FACOs came around, I started to do them very early on because most people were afraid of machines, and I like machines. Uh, everyone was saying how FACOs were no better than extra capsular surgery, and it's just because we like the machines. This is the same story. And I was actually asked about 10 years ago to be the spokesperson at the American Academy and say why we should not use femtos. At the time, we had higher incidence of anterior capsular tears and a few things, and I said it wasn't a good idea. Well, I have changed my mind. So I show this slide because my only real complex will be things that I show you that are in the book I wrote. And so I'm biased for that, but nothing else. Um, so the person who wrote this chapter for us on flax and bilateral surgery was Laurent Lalonde. He was the first in the world to perform routine bilateral uh, femtofaco, and he presented at our meeting in 2014, um, showing how the patients just did better. So there are a number of people who have done very good work in uh, femtolaser-assisted cataract surgery. The first, of course, is Zoltan Naj from Semmelweis University in Budapest, and wrote the first few papers and was the first one in the world to do this. And then subsequent to that, people who were very keen for femtos like Burkhard Dick, Lisa Arbister, and Tim Schultz talked about various ways we can address some of the problems that were occurring with femtosecond surgery, the same as we had problems in the first days of FACO, because everything that's new has problems. So uh, Harish, as you just heard, wrote this paper, and it was the first one in the world to stratify patients according to potential difficulty and show that the more difficult we expected the case to be, the more benefit there was for doing uh, femtosecond laser surgery. The curious thing with Harish is he was an Eye Foundation student, and after he published this paper, he was a big star all over the world, and he was just starting his residency. And the next group of students we had that came in, we always asked them which mentor they want to work with for their research project. I can tell you that every single student wanted to work with Harish, and none of, a, none of them with the, the mentors. And it was quite funny because we all were out of a job, and we all asked Harish if he wanted students. Uh, so his paper went across very well. So the problem was, the main problem were femtocapsulotomy tears. And at first there were 10% reports of tears. And then after that was worked out a bit and got down to be less and less, but ended up with still 8.3 times number of anterior capsular tears with femto compared to doing FACO. So uh, Lisa Arbusser, Tim Schultz, and Burkhard Dick published this paper on doing this dimple down technique, which probably everybody does. The only thing wrong with that technique is if you have like a corneal scar or some shield of the laser somewhere, you will have, let's say, in one area the, over here, an area that's not torn, and doing a dimple down technique will not give you a clean capsulotomy, and it can tear out. So I published this paper in 2020 talking about how we can use OVDs to press the center of the capsule, and then we can go along and we can do the capsulotomy and get rid of tears. 
and the last thousand cases, uh, I've had zero tears. So I'm going to show you this. And here is a patient where it looks like the capsule on the left side here is not separated. And so when I inject the OVD, and here I'm using Helon GV, you see that the capsule actually comes away. So in this case, it looks like we had to do something, but really we didn't because it came away just with the OVD. It's just where it was sitting. So we go in with these forceps. I push down the periphery because that's what Gills taught us, that if you push the perimeter down, the capsule will tear inwards and not outwards. So I propose that we do what are called Gillsian capsulorexis rather than folding it back, you fold it in. So in this other case, it didn't work. So I'm going to go in with the OVD. Again, it's uh, Helon GV. And as I push down, you see that none of those bubbles move. The capsule is still adherent, the capsulotomy to the peripheral capsule. So now when I go in with these forceps, you'll see that when I depress, it actually tears the capsule. And it tears it. You can see it pull away. And you can see the tension, if you look very carefully, between the capsulotomy and the peripheral capsule. But that removes it. And because you're pulling inwards and backwards, it doesn't tear out. So that really totally solves the problems. If you did a dimple down technique and in difficult cases do this, you don't get any more capsular tears. So much for that. These are the forceps I use, I'm not trying to sell them, but they work. And I use this cannula because it's gentle. You can use much lower injection forces because it's a small cannula and less fluid and achieve good results without any problems. So what I'm telling you is I'm convinced that we will all move to flax or some other laser procedure. They just came out with a new femtosecond laser, it's small and cheap in Europe to do the capsulotomies. And we'll keep having better and better and cheaper devices like we have had with FACOs over time. And what I do now is this list of 10 types of cataract patients, I encourage them to do femtosecond lasers so they do better. Very dense cataracts become easy cataracts. The black ones are no problem. You just crank up the laser, breaks it up, take it out. White cataracts, you get a perfect capsulotomy every single time, no problem. Moderate or severe sort of exfoliation, the lens is broken up, you just take it out and you hope the bag is okay. If not, you support the bag. Shallow chambers, you don't touch the cornea. Much safer, you can do them, very easy. Fuchs cases, again, you don't touch the cornea. Much less flow, much less energy. You, you, you protect endothelial cells very well. Fibrotic capsules are very difficult to do sometimes. The laser just breaks them open and it's not a problem. Myotonic dystrophy patients have very, very elastic capsules, so they're difficult, but they're easy with the femto. One of the big ones are posterior polar cataracts. They are much, much, much easier with the femto because it leaves a layer of cortex in front of the hole. And so you can just do the case and take out that piece of cortex at the end, not a problem. post vitrectomy cases, the whole eye stays still, not a problem. Flomax cases, you basically do the capsulotomy before you touch the inside of the eye. And so it's not a problem to do those cases easier. So I'm saying that you're going to find that like with FACO, we will gradually move to this, to better technology and do things better. FACO was also deemed to be unbelievably expensive in 1980. But as time went on, everyone has a FACO machine. And if you use it all the time, it's not very expensive. And that's what I think will happen. So thank you very much. And uh, maybe we'll move on to our next session and have the questions at the end. Just keep your questions and we can do them at the end. So the next session is going to be also uh, by Marco. All right, perfect. So I'll just keep on going here. So the next topic we had was, um, sorry. Looking at the notion of intracameral antibiotics and should they be used in cataract surgery? And so this is a, a second poll question here. Uh, Dr. Rai, if we could uh, bring up the, the poll. And so uh, what proportion of the time do you use intracameral antibiotics during cataract surgery? <clears throat> Same answers as before. So 80 to 100%, 60 to 80, 40 to 60, 20 to 40, or zero to 20% of the time. So I'll share this with you, but you either have people not using them at all or using them a lot. <laughs> so you, you're on the two, two ends of the spectrum here. Quite interesting, for sure. So I'll go into the uh, some of the salient issues. So intracameral antibiotics, as we know, um, were were are used for for the um, to to prevent postoperative endophthalmitis, and we we know that that really you know this is one of the most devastating complications of cataract surgery, and and you know the more cases of endophthalmitis that we can prevent, uh, really the better. Um, the proponents for intracameral antibiotics would say, well, you know they 
they they should be used because they have a high efficacy and and that's been uh, shown in in some of the studies. They're they're fairly low risk. There's not a lot of risk of using intracameral antibiotics. And um, as opposed to topical drops, which you know start at the cornea and need to penetrate inwards, uh, they you know intracameral antibiotics provide a higher dose of antibiotics at the intended site of surgery. And of course, there are no issues with with compliance. Uh, opponents would then say, well, you know. Yes, if there was a commercially available solution, you know many of the um, many of these points would be addressed. But but right now there's not an available commercially uh, commercial solution for intracameral use, and so we know that any time you put anything into the eye, it has to have um, you know a physiologic concentration, pH, and osmolarity. And so if we're now tinkering around with with different uh, preparations and they don't have um, uh, you know factors that are that are similar to the eye, that that might cause uh, you know, uh, intraocular damage. And so there, there could also be a risk of um, TAS as well. Uh, we don't know about the risk of dilution errors with intracameral antibiotics, and, and we uh, ideally want a solution that's preservative free. The final point is that, you know, sure, maybe in, in uh, developing countries where, where the endophthalmitis rates at baseline may be uh, higher, uh, intracameral antibiotics should be used in all cases. But, you know, in, in um, Toronto, we see our, our baseline rates of endophthalmitis very low. So why would we introduce all of these risks and, and this level of uncertainty uh, when our baseline rates are so low? And so I'll go into a study by the, in the JCRS in 2007 that was, that was led by the ESCRS, which was, which was really a landmark study at the time uh, looking at intracameral antibiotics and their role in cataract surgery, they randomized uh, over 16,000 eyes and they randomized them into four groups. And so uh, patients in all groups received post-operative uh, topical uh, uh, levofloxacin, uh, but then they were randomized to either receive just the post-op um, uh, levofloxacin drops or just receive the intracameral antibiotic with the post-op drops or uh, the intracameral antibiotics with the with drops both at pre-op and post-op, or um, receiving pre-op drops and post-op drops, but not receiving an intracameral injection. And what you could see on the slide here is that you know in both group groups B and D, uh, which were similar sizes to groups A and A and C, the the rates of endophthalmitis were were significantly lower, and both groups uh, B and D did have the intracameral cefuroxime uh, injection. Um, so it really, the, the overall conclusion here was that whether you gave uh, antibiotics pre-op, so that was, you know, starting from an hour before surgery in regular intervals, five different administrations until surgery, that didn't really make much of a difference, but the intracameral injection uh, really had an effect. And so this is a, um, a table from, from their paper here showing that the odds ratio was uh, 5.86. So there was more than a 5.8 uh, times uh, greater odds of sustaining endophthalmitis if you did not have the cefuroxime injection relative to if you did. And again, for the for the um, uh, pre-op drops, uh, there was really no difference. And so, you know, again, one of the risks I mentioned is the, the potential for TAS. And so uh, what was encouraging about this study was that in a large cohort in over 16,000 patients, uh, there was only one recorded case of TAS. Um, so then you might say, well, you know, this study was looking at intracameral cefuroxime, and, and we know that that what we have in Canada, which which is uh, intracameral moxifloxacin, is different, and and you know there still may be these concerns around osmolarity, around pH, and other factors um, to ensure that that the solution is physiologic, and so here's really where Dr. Arshinov and his team were were you know leaders in, in terms of. Um, uh, publishing kind of evidence to guide practice on the use of intracameral moxifloxacin. And so they, they uh, published a, a, a review of their cases, looking at um, first a, a total of just over 3,000 cases um, where they injected a 0.1 cc's of intracameral moxifloxacin. And, and uh, in this group, they found a single infection. And this, this was a uh, moxifloxacin resistant strain of uh, staph staphylococcal uh, uh, epidermidis. Um, what happened afterwards, because they had the single infection, well, they thought, well, could could the you know the way we prepare the solution, um, could it be better to actually uh, increase the concentration of solution so that we have no cases of endophthalmitis? And and so when they made this change, they actually found in a second sample of over four thousand cases that there was no no um, case of endophthalmitis. And I'll share with you in a little bit exactly what that change was. They found no complications with using uh, intracameral. Uh, antibiotics and no cases of TAS. And so this is a, a complicated slide here from, from their paper, but uh, just to bring home the point that um, 
basically on the left-hand side, you see here, if you gave 0.1 cc's of a lower dose of moxifloxacin, so only 100 uh, micrograms, um, the, the effective concentration in the anterior chamber where you want the drug to be is still too low relative to what an ideal threshold would be. And you might ask, well, how do we know what the ideal threshold is? And it's based on this concept of MIC90, which is the 90% minimum inhibitory concentration. So what is the concentration of moxifloxacin that we need to uh, kill off or to inhibit 90% of the uh, bacterial growth? And so that we use that as a threshold. And then we, you know, uh, we multiply that by 10 times. So we want at least 10 times of the MIC90 uh, for us to feel safe that, you know, what we're administering into the eye is a sufficient enough concentration uh, to kill the bugs. And then we see like, as you increase the uh, dose of moxifloxacin given, uh, 0.2 cc's, 0.3 cc's, 0.4 cc's, et cetera, uh, we, we get at the time of injection, we do meet that threshold of over 10 times of the MIC90 concentration. And so this, this was really the research that, that uh, pioneered the concept that, you know, Vigamox, when we administer it intracamerally, should be diluted. Uh, we should uh, ideally take three cc's of 0.5% moxifloxacin and combine it with seven cc's of BSS and then administer uh, 0.3 or 0.4 cc's of the combined solution. That would really provide us with the 450 or 600 micrograms that would be needed of, of moxifloxacin to be at an over 10 times uh, MIC90 concentration. And so this should be administered when the procedure has been concluded in the final step. And you should use a hockey stick cannula as you, show, as you uh, see here at the bottom, uh, right on top of the lens to, um, to you know, provide the, the medication directly to the, to the site of surgery. And so the overall conclusion was that, that there were advantages to using this dilution uh, system and this method of administration. Um, uh, over not administering int intracameral antibiotics, and there was minimum, minimal risk. And so I'll move on to uh, Dr. Arshinov's uh, talk and then discussion. Okay, thank you. So let me um, share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see it. So I'm going to talk also about bilateral surgery because the reason people were against doing bilateral surgery for 100 years is because we had no antibiotics and no reasonable prevention for infection. And people were always afraid of getting bilateral simultaneous post-op endophthalmitis. And so we were taught, all of us, that we should never do bilateral surgery, that we should find ways to make sure we don't get infections first. So what's allowed the return to interest in bilateral surgery? Well, between 1980 and 1995, OVDs and this entire list of things, including the lens designs, the capsular excess, foldable lenses, cartridges, numerous things have made it such that surgery has much lower complications. And therefore, if you have a very low complication rate, you can consider doing bilateral surgery with the only thing left out now is still infections. So where do we learn to do injections? The first person was Golan Payman, who began in 1974 to inject antibiotics directly into the vitreous. He was the first one to begin to inject the drugs right into the eye rather than giving systemic medications. It was then Gimbel and Gills who took that and began to give intracameral antibiotics prophylactically, and they began to publish infection rates of less than one in 10,000, which nobody else in the world was having. And uh, Howard Gimbel taught me how to use intracameral antibiotics in like 1991, and I've been using them ever since, but changing the drug as we got better drugs. So when people credit the ESDRS study, the truth is that's not where it came from. It was in St. Eric's Hospital in Stockholm. They noticed between 1990 and 1995, when you're looking at the papers of Gimbel and Gills, that they had infection rates which were way, way higher than being reported by Gimbel and Gills. And so what they did, they did toxicity studies and in the usual Swedish manner, studied everything in great detail to find out what to use. And they found cefuroxime to probably be the best drug at the time. That was before we had moxifloxacin in, in the world. And they supplemented it with ampicillin because they knew that enterococcus was the weak link and infections with that which occurred when you give cefuroxime caused blindness because the drug is of the same group as the drugs we use to treat endophthalmitis. And therefore, they didn't respond well. Here's the group that did that work. They did, wrote a few papers, and it was really fantastic. The ESRS simply copied them. The study is a complete copy of the Montan study. And they showed the same results. Even the ratios of improvement were exactly the same. But the ESCS advertises very well. We reviewed uh, a couple of years ago 
every case of bilateral post-op endocytitis in the world in the past 50 years. There were nine cases. In every single one of those, they had breached the protocol we put out as the International Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgeons of how to do bilateral surgery safely. Uh, but most of them did not receive any antibiotics. One patient was septic when he had surgery, which is not a good sign. Uh, then one, one case, the uh, instruments weren't put in the autoclave at all. And then the other ones, one had Burkholderia from re illegal reconstruction of a ventilation system and blowing bacteria into the operating room. And two of them were elderly immunodeficient patients, uh, which is not good. Since this, and since bilateral surgery became more popular with the pandemic, there have been four more cases. There have been one case from Japan where they did not uh, sterilize the instruments, use the same ones for both eyes, didn't follow the instructions of the society. And then there were three cases in a a non-compliant private clinic in Denmark uh, that don't follow any of the principles we published, and they were shut down. And they were told, actually, I just came back from Denmark, they had to read our book and pass an exam on it before they reopened their clinic. So that's where that stands. So this particular document that we published on how to do bilateral surgery safely has been uh, called by some people the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments of Bilateral Surgery, and it's pretty well entrenched now is how people can do safe bilateral cataract surgery. The point is, it prevents infections by insisting we give intracameral drugs. Likelihood of bilateral simultaneous post-op infections is less than one in 100 million if you follow the instructions and use intracameral drugs. That's the same risk you have as driving from your house to buy a piece, a loaf of bread a block away in your car. It's a minimal, minimal risk. You have much more chance of winning the lottery. So the first place to do routine bilateral cataract surgery properly was the group in Laval University. Marie-Ève Le Garret, uh, on June 9, 2020, went online in a French presentation that I attended. And she was the first, other than us, where we published an infection rate of 1 in 17,000, to publish an infection rate of 1 in 15,000 in the same ballpark. And we expect that as we follow these instructions and do things well and give drugs, we're going to be looking at infection rates of less than 1 in 20,000, which nobody gets unless they do this. There were now uh, reports of TAS, and the first publication of TAS in bilateral surgery came from Jan Venter at the meeting in South Africa. These were cases in Glasgow at Optical Express. The problem with Optical Express and many commercial companies is they change things that they use in the operating room based upon how much it costs them. And one of the criteria we have in doing bilateral surgery is you change nothing without everybody reviewing what you're going to use next time. And that's why they had TAS. And all the cases did OK, but they had eight cases of TAS. So we just published a paper uh, with uh, Bill Shee. And then uh, I, I was late for the ESCRS. And so Melanie Hebert, who helped us write the book, presented this uh, at the ESCRS for us. And what this tells you is how to administer uh, intracranial moxifloxacin. And so we compared the various ways that people in different parts of the world prepare moxifloxacin and inject it. And the reason for doing this is the ASCRS published last October a protocol to use two systems, both of which don't work. So I thought we would write this paper and figure out how to do it better. And so what we did is we compared the different methods. Everyone agrees how much you should have in the eye because of a study by Lieber and Matthews, which showed that only moxifloxacin will kill all the bacteria we get in endophthalmitis. But for to do so, you have to have more than 0.5 milligrams in the anterior chamber. And you can't play with the eye afterwards to, to have something leak out. So let me show you. On the left side, you're seeing a video of how I inject intracranial moxifloxacin. First, I seal the main incision and you watch the chamber deepens. When the chamber deepens, you know it's not leaking. Then you come back with the moxifloxacin and you inject it and you inject it uh, diluted so that when you inject it, you have enough force to actually blow open the capsular bag rotate the lens wherever you want it to be, center it, you get on the angle you want, whatever you like, and you keep injecting until you have 0.55 injected into the anterior chamber. And I'll explain why it's 0.55. This other video is of a world-famous surgeon injecting moxifloxacin. You see how much leaked out? At least half leaked out. Then they go and adjust intraocular pressure. There's no way they got even one half of the intended injection into the anterior chamber. Not a good technique. So our study was to figure out how to do it properly. Well, it turns out that in engineering math, you learn how to figure out how much stays in the eye when you inject things into a leaky sink or whatever. And we checked these three techniques. Method one was right from the bottle. Method two was the method of Shorstein in California. 
0.5 mils of 100 micrograms in 0.1 mil, and method three is my method of 150 micrograms in 0.1 mil, about 0.5 of a mil. Okay, when you do a mathematical problem, you have to have assumptions. The assumptions are simple that it's this constant, stable environment, not complicated. You get the math, which nobody wants to read, but you get these graphs. And these graphs show three things. The first method where you inject 0.1 cc has a very steep line. A very steep line means it's very hard to get the right amount into the eye. If you inject a little bit too much, a little bit too less, you're not going to get anywhere near the amount. Because nurses always give you less than you want to get, not more, you're always going to be under. And if you look at this table, it shows you how much under you are. You're under by quite a lot when you use this method. If you use the method of Shorstein, you have to inject an infinite amount to get what you need in the eye. Of course, you can't inject an infinite amount, so you never get close to how much you need in the eye. And my method, because it was designed based upon this math, ends up giving you almost exactly what you want. If you inject 0.55 cc's and you allow, can allow for leakage, you end up with the right amount. So here's how you make it. You put the whole bottle of Vigamox in a syringe, you fill seven cc's more of BSS, and there you are, you have enough glass for the whole day. It's very easy to do. You divide it in alloc watts. You know that the pH is balanced because it's BSS and it's not a problem and it's non-preserved, but you have to use Vigamox or you can use the Sando generic, which is exactly the same, but you can't just buy one off the shelf that's a copy because you don't know what's in it. All right, so my conclusion here, we will all do bilateral surgery as a default procedure over time. Everyone is more and more doing it. And we will all use IC moxifloxacin more or less in this method until a new one comes out and proves to be better. And I think it works. And if you want to get infection rates of less than 1 in 20,000, that's what you got to do. It seems to work. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Steve, for that for that wonderful summary. Uh, maybe we'll go to Ellen's talk next, and then we'll hold the discussion till the end, if that's okay. Just to make correct. sure Ellen has that's enough. the plan. Your turn, Ellen. Can you hear me and see my slides okay? Can you yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen. Uh, my name is Alan Zhu. I'm a PGY5 resident in the program. Today, I would like to discuss um, ophthalmic viscosurgical devices, OVDs, their rheologic properties and the applications in cataract surgery. I would like to thank Dr. Ashinov for sharing his lectures at uh, this year's ESCRS. So um, in order to understand when and how we use OVDs, we must first understand their rheologic properties. So rheology is the study of fluid behavior in response to applied forces. It has many applications in the nature and different fields of science, such as geology. And in our case, uh, rheology discusses the change of OVD's viscosity in response to shear forces. And during cataract sur surgery, shear forces come from the turbulence generated by the phaco needles, or the IA probe. So for all the fluids in the nature, we can group them into four different rheologic patterns. For our OVDs and ketchups, um, they belong to pseudoplastics. Their viscosity decreases in the concave down manner as shown here as the shear rate increases. For plastic fluids such as mayonnaise, their viscosity decreases in a linear fashion compared to the shear rates. And for Newtonian fluids such as water, their viscosity is independent of the shear rate, which maintains constants as shown in the red line here. And for the last group, the dilatants such as cornstarch, their viscosity increases in a concave up manner uh, as the shear rate increases. And here are the examples of four different types of rheologic fluids. And next time we can all think about it at the dinner table. So all the OVDs are pseudoplastic. And we take advantage of this concave down relationship during phacal surgeries. When the shear rate is very low, such as during rexus, we can employ, we often employ the um, soft shell technique because here the visco is very good at coating structures and protecting them because their viscosity is very low. In comparison, Helon GV and Provis, they belong to the cohesive class and have a higher viscosity. And therefore we inject them after injecting the um, wrist coat and these uh, OVDs can reform the space. As we, uh, as we increase the shear rate, such as during IA, interestingly, at this point, the visco has a higher viscosity compared to the rest. And that will explain why we must pay extra attention when, you, when we are removing visco 
and to avoid post-op IOP spike. So there are three classes of OVDs um, we are using right now. We often directly compare the cohesive and dispersive OVDs. For the cohesive classes, uh, as I mentioned, there's um, Helon GV and Provis. They have a higher viscosity at low to mid shear rates. And that's because their molecules are heavier and longer. That's why they can congeal together better, better at maintaining space and easier to remove. On the other hand, we also have dispersive OVDs such as viscode and Ocucode here. They have a lower viscosity at low shear rates and the molecules that are made up of these materials, they are smaller um, and shorter. So they, are very, they have a very high codability, very good at protecting tissues, but at the same time, a little bit harder to remove. So we must pay attention. More recently, there's a third class in the market, which is the visco adaptive OVDs. And the, and the example we use often is Helon-5. Again, they are made up with very long chain molecules, but these chains can be easily broken with a high shear rate. And that's why um, during IA, this molecule can fracture into smaller mo uh, molecules and behave more like a dispersive. And again, just similar to viscose, we have to pay attention during the removal. So OVDs are very important for all kinds of surgeries. They have multiple um, uses during cataract surgeries, especially for challenging cases, such as intumescent uh, cataract to prevent the Argentinian effect signs. Um, for tougher cases, when we implant three-piece IOLs, we need to use visco to protect the back, so, um, it, as well as during pseudo-X and IFAS cases. OVDs are also indispensable in glaucoma and cornea surgeries. So in the next few slides, I will show some um, surgeries. And I would like to thank the surgeons who mentored me through these cases. The first is a GAP procedure, a glaucoma procedure for a patient with glaucoma. Um, here is a nice example showing where OCDs can be used to partition space. So in the first step, step uh, I created a goniotomy here very often you will encounter blood. So I injected more cohesive OVD provis here to form a clear space right in the middle and pushing the blood to the right side. So I partitioned the AC into two, two places right now. And OVD is also very important here as I was trying to dilate the Schlem's canal, again, using the property of them very good at forming spaces. And by dilating the Schlem's canal here, that allow me enough space to pass through the suture. And throughout this procedure, the gap procedure, uh, very often we will encounter blood. Um, so OVD will also be used to tamper out the bleed. And some, um, some glaucoma surgeon will also leave 15% um, of OVDs uh, post-op to prevent post-operative bleeding. Um, so I'm wondering if Dr. Ashenoff want to comment on the on the cataract on this surgery. Or I can move on to the next. No, move on. We'll video. discuss it later. Okay. So, oops, sorry. So here's my first poll question: Is that you know uh, you someone perform a glaucoma surgery the next day? You have a flat chamber. IOP is one. So I gave you these uh, rheologic curves, and which kind of OVD would like to pull in? Uh, a is Helon-5, B is Provis, C is Viscoat, D is just BSS. IOP is one, chamber is flat. You want to maintain a certain IOP. You've got a bit of a mix here, Alan. Yeah, um, so definitely using Helon-5 because as shown on the curve here, they have a higher viscosity at the low shear rate. So basically a, a very quiet chamber. And even with that, very often uh, the next day, the IOP dropped down to single digit. So in the next case, it's relatively routine case where um, the pay is an example of soft shell technique as proposed by Dr. Ashinoff. Um, relatively small eye, shallow AC, and the patient ha had a history of uveitis with some sneaky eye. So I first injected a dispersive OVD and, inject and followed by cohesive OVD and that allowed me enough space to uh, perform the rest of surgery. And so suffice to say the rest of surgery is quite routine. 
So for interest time, I can move on to the, um, so this is a, a backup case. Um, do we have enough time to go through this case? If you hurry up. Yeah, we do, go ahead. Okay. Um, so in this case is, um, so I actually have a little question for Dr. Ashinov is that it's a very dense cataract, a very small pupil. Um, sorry about the main one, it's not the best main one I've ever made. made. Um, and so I was trying to, in, so I've injected Helon GV in this case. I was trying to initiate a, a capsule rexus using a Utrada. Uh, as you can see here, I tried to poke and poke and poke on the anterior capsule. And I realized that this person, although it's not written on the chart, also has an element of soninopathy. And I was debating if I should add more heal on GV because I'm just afraid that it will push down the whole cataract and further damage the, the sonials. So I switched um, to using a sister tone and the rest of cataract is more or less routine, except that the pupil keeps coming down. It was a little bit challenging, but it was, um, completely as planned. So my question for Dr. Ashinov is that I'm not sure if I should add more heal on GV. Oh, well, you're better off with heal on five. You don't have to exert pressure. You want stability. Uh, you muted, Dr. Ashinov. And if you do heal on, am I muted? Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, we can hear you. You're, you're good, Steve. Okay. If you use heal on five and you put a thin layer of balance salt or a drug like xylocaine below muted. it, it just keeps it stable. It's not the pressure, but by repeated injection, you want is stability. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so the take home message of my talk is that all the OVD is through the plastic, and we are really taking advantage of this concave down uh, curve, which there's a certain stability at the low and mid. Uh, shear rate, and that allows us to perform a lot of maneuvers during cataract surgeries. There are three classes of OVDs, cohesive, dispersive, and viscoadaptive, and their properties are really granted by their molecular structures. Um, and here is, a, again, is that comparison between the two types. Um, and OVD is a very versatile in all kinds of ophthalmic procedures. If one thing I took away from the Sally lesson lecture is that um, the OVDs are cheaper than the vitreous. So I uh, have very low threshold to use them during my, uh, during uh, as I'm learning cataract surgery. And with that, thank you. Okay, thank you all. That was a very good review. Okay, so let me just share my screen and uh, say a few things, and then we can have questions. Okay, so I want you to understand that it's not exerting pressure. The main reason why we have different OVDs and use them differently is because you want to partition the space that we're working in. You want to partition to a working area and to a protected area. And if you realize that's what we're trying to do, it becomes much easier to understand OVDs. So the first thing is that the very brief summary of dispersives and cohesives is that higher viscosity cohesives create space and you can induce and sustain pressure where you need it and lower viscosity dispersives have prolonged retention, and they partition spaces better. If you don't use a dispersive at all, and water can be considered dispersive, it's very hard to partition spaces. So the soft shell technique simply uses both dispersive and cohesive together to gain the advantages of both and not have any disadvantages of each group. It's quite simple. Here's a video. Usually a classic technique called the Arshinov shell. What you do is you first place a dispersive viscoelastic and you place it right over the lens and just fill the anterior chamber about a third or so. And then right over the lens, just anterior to the lens, you place a cohesive viscoelastic, which pushes that dispersive viscoelastic up to the corneal endothelium and coats it during the procedure. This is Tom Wood, University of Iowa. Thank you very much. So note there, Tom makes nice videos that when you uh, add the cohesive behind the dispersive, the stranding of the dispersive goes away from the, when the pressure you induce. And that's important not to worry about it, but just to go do it and it works. And it always works with physics. The patient had a history of blunt trauma with a sublux lens and a fairly dense cataract. You can see that the lens had been prolapsed a bit inferiorly. Here we're gonna use a sideways Arshinov shell where we place some viscose in the area of the loose zonules and then place provisc in the other area and squeeze over the viscoat into the area with the missing zonules. 
This is another example of how you can use soft shell techniques in different kinds of cases. It just makes your life easier. And Tom makes very nice videos. So here, I want to show you how you use Elon 5. You, you don't want to use it by itself because it's so viscous that the resistance to movement of instruments is 7 million times the resistance of moving instruments in water, which is difficult. So when you do the pre-caps or exit step, you fill the eye mostly with the Helon 5, but beneath it, you put a little layer of balanced salt or I use xylocaine and phenylephrine. So you move the instruments in a resistance area of water, but the chamber is filled up with an OVD to induce the pressure of a high viscosity OVD. And the pre-implantation step, all you have to do is block the incision, cover the capsorexis, and you can fill the bag with balanced salt, put the lens in the bag, and it comes out because it's only in front of the lens and not behind it. And here's the case, not a femto. You can see it's not a perfectly round rexus. I just inject the OVD, Helon 5, in front of the capsorexis. Then I fill the bag with balanced salt. The eye is pressurized because the Helon 5 blocks the incision. I then come back with the lens, inject it into the bag. It's going into water, but I leave a little bit of OVD in the front of the syringe so that when it goes in, it lubricates the posterior capsule. Inject the lens. The lens starts to open. I put the IA in the eye, and the pressure of the IA push, it pops the lens back in the bag. The OVD all comes out because it's in front of the lens and not behind it. And the lens starts to spin, telling you there's nothing in the bag except for the lens. OVD is all gone. And the case is easy. This makes your life a lot easier. And it's very, very stable because you're relying on the pressures and the OVDs to create uh, an environment for you to make life easier. OK, so the tri soft shell technique is merely an example of how to use all different layers together to partition spaces better. Here's a dispersive uh, layer, the viscoadaptive or cohesive layer, and a layer of balanced salt or uh, xylocaine and phenylephrine. And by having those three layers, you partition the chamber into three spaces, and you can do whatever you want in each of those three spaces. Each one is designed to make it better for what you're trying to do there. This is the paper we wrote. Anybody who wants, I can give you a copy. And it has all these illustrations of how it should look and how you partition things. And here's the image of the figures we published showing you how to, to do that. And here's the uh, animation showing you simply what you do. You inject again the dispersive on the surface of the lens. You come back with the viscoadaptive or cohesive on the lens, pushing the dispersive up against the coronary where you want it to be. You don't need it anywhere else. And then putting a little leg of balanced salt. If you use low flow techniques in difficult cases, and work only in the balanced salt area. Because the volume is so small, a flow rate of 15 is the same as a flow rate of 45 in the entire anterior chamber. And so you can do the case in the capsular bag with a low flow rate, and it looks like a normal case until you crank up the flow rate and wash out the OVDs. It just makes your life easier. So here's how it looks, the image of how it should look for Fuchs cases or low cell counts with these layers. And here you cover the endothelium completely. Whereas here, if you want to do a soft shell bridge for uh, flow max cases, instead of this uh, parameter of how it looks, you make it like this and cover the iris so it can't flop. You can then stretch it and do whatever you want, makes the case easy, and it's stable because the viscoid in the corner is holding the iris quite stable. That's all I want to show you. I'm happy to give you uh, longer lectures on uh, OBDs whenever you want. Um, <clears throat> I know it's long and complicated. So now we can have questions on all three subjects. Excellent, Steve, thank you. Alan, you look like you may have a question. I do. So Steve, what about, you know, we've had uh, Vigamox, moxifloxacin around for a long time, and we're just doing a study with one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Agarwal, about corneal ulcers and uh, the trends over a 20-year period. So we have seen lots of holes developing in the sensitivity to moxifloxacin. I know you mentioned this in your talk that this will be replaced when we get a better antibiotic. Are you seeing this at all with your um, uh, with with patients who are getting currently moxifloxacin? We know that the main cause of endophthalmitis is gram positives, and there are some areas where there's gaps developing to moxifloxacin. Well, there actually aren't any gaps. They're dose dependent. So unlike other drugs, moxifloxacin kills anything in a high enough concentration. Uh, and the study we did on how much to inject, make sure that you achieve a high enough concentration to kill every bacteria that's ever been isolated from an eye. And uh, I've done it for over 12,000 cases now with that particular dose, and it's fine. You don't get any infected. Clear, clear anterior chambers. 
You get no fibrin. Fibrin, by the way, is caused for low-grade infections. Uh, we have a number of cases around the world. Uh, people are showing that when they get fibrin, they get Burkhold dairy or something else growing very slowly. But if you use high-dose intercarboxyfloxacin, not undiluted because you can then get it behind the iris and you can get Bates syndrome if you get it uh, caught there. But if you inject a diluted amount in the right way, you get more than 0 0.5 milligrams and it kills everything. I mean, kudos to you for coming out with that. I think that's great. I've seen a little bit of a difference when with corneal infections, where we've had you know patients who were started on Vigamox in the community and there's they're still not responding. But um, I, I think this has made an important difference in uh, in reducing rates of endophthalmitis. Another quick question, Gail, going on to viscoelastics. Um, can I just can add, comment? respond to you for a second? Sure. Corneas are different because the anterior chamber is a closed environment. Corneas aren't. So mm -hmm. in corneas, you really have to go from giving topical Vigamox as your first try, if you give it right away, to then using fortified antibiotics because you really have to get a dose that's flowing on the cornea, not just one shot like in the eye. It's not a closed environment. So you're right. Corneas are different. Interesting observation, and I thank you. What about what about talking about viscoelastics? What about the difference? What about using a disco visc? Can you comment on that? I mean, a lot of people, a lot of the ORs will just stock uh, disco visc, hoping uh, for the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's not. Disco visc was manufactured and first given an inappropriate name. Nothing can be dispersive and cohesive at the same time. It's like the jockey being tall and short, or the best ball player being tall and short at the same time. Just you can't be that way. It's a linear. Uh, uh, range, and you're either somewhere on that range, you can't be both ends at the same time. Discovisc is actually a copy of Ambisc. It's made to be sort of in the middle, which means it's okay for regular normal cases, but it's not good for any case. It's a problem. Uh, you, you're much better off using soft shell techniques, and you're actually better off if you use Helon 5 and Viscoat than using Viscoat and Provisc, because mm -hmm. Helon 5 is much more extreme in behavior, and the more extreme the two OBDs are from each other, the better off you're going to be. And the three best are used, uh, Viscoat first, then Helon 5, then Balanced All Solution. And what I do, by the way, is after injecting every single OVD, I always inject a layer of Balanced All with some drug in it. So that my nurses know, after the OVD, you hand me the syringe with the drug or the, whatever it is I'm going to do. Because if you want a very thin layer of just Balanced All, so your surgery is done with low resistance. Why do you want to make your surgery difficult to push through Helon 5? It just makes life harder. So you put a thin, thin layer of balanced alter with the drug, and you do the surgery there. The eye is pressurized with the OVD. It's put, the cornea is protected because it is coat against the cornea, and you have no concerns anymore. It just makes life easier. I think we should all strive to be lazy surgeons. Have the OVDs do it for you, and just go there and make your little circle that you want to do and make it easy. It's a lot or easier. Or at least surgeons. Uh, good point, Steve. Good observations. Steve, what, what, a question for you with respect to intracameral antibiotics. What would you say to the surgeon who is reluctant to adopt them on the basis that they're off-label for intracameral use? Okay, uh, let me tell you the history. Everything is off-label. Well, you're a doctor. You're licensed to do what you think is best for the patient. If you think it's best for the patient, it's not off-label. So off-label refers to commercial sales, not to what you as a doctor choose to do. So whenever I read this stuff, I think it's ridiculous because everything you do carries the same risk for you. You can take any on-label drug and inject it inappropriately, and you're guilty. But if you inject one that's supposedly off-label and do it properly, you're not guilty. So I think it makes no difference. And I think you're far better off to make up the moxifloxin in the operating room, which I do, and I do it with balanced salt, because I know that when I do it, there's no mistakes. We had some pharmacies try to make it up once in a while, they have a new technician in the morning. They make it up with water rather than BSS. Great. You just wreck 10 corneas uh, or all kinds of things. You're far better off to just do it yourself in a syringe. It takes you about maybe five seconds to put the whole bottle of Vigamox in, seven cc's of BSS, and you're set for the day. Or if you, if you do more cases, you do it, do it again later at noon. But it's, it's very, very easy, and you have the exact concentration you need. And we showed from the math, you have to inject 0.55. CCs and it's fine. And our next paper is going to show you what to do if you break the capsule. Because you know, from India, they showed that with broken capsules, you had a high rinse of infection. It's another mathematical problem to find out what happens in those cases, which we're working on and we'll publish it soon. I also think, from a medical legal standpoint, just having that consensus statement that you produce can be very helpful to alleviate those concerns for those surgeons. So 
Thank you for, for your work on that. Uh, question from Dr. Youssel um, regarding flax in patients with small pupils. Um, what's your what's your experience in those particular cases? And I'm I, you know, in relation to that as well, I, I noticed you listed um, patients on Flomax as a possible indication for femtos. So that's kind of related there as well. Maybe you can touch upon that. Okay, so the one the one thing that uh, I find difficult are very small pupils because often they're fibrotic. The Flomax ones aren't so bad because they initially dilate if you give them enough drops. And then you can do it because once you've done the rectus, you don't care anymore if the pupil gets small because you tampon at it uh, with the OVDs. You can stretch the pupil whatever you want. It's perfectly fine. Um, Burkhard Dick, he actually goes and he injects the OVDs to open the pupils and stretch them. And then he goes and does the, the femto on them afterwards. I kind of don't like doing that because whenever you put an OVD in the eye, you change somewhat the optics of the anterior chamber and you change somewhat how that the uh, femto is going to work and you may end up with capsulotomies that aren't complete. So for those really, really small ones or fibronic pupils, I actually do them manually. It's one of the only cases that I won't always do femtos. So even like I had a patient this week who told me they want femto and the pupils were like two millimeters and they were, didn't stretch, they were fibronic. I said, I'm not going to do femto on you. And, you know, that's the way it goes. Because there are some cases you can do better manually. But the 10 cases I told you before, they work out much better over the femto. Now, with respect to that, another question here. Um, can you comment on, you know, with respect to the economic burden of, of femto, both for the patient as well as society as a whole, um, and the cost-benefit analysis there? Um, sure. Okay. So I go around the world in lecture, not that I'm trying to brag, but you know, you go to different places and they say, well, we do manual small incision cataract surgery because, you know, it's cheap and we can do it for $5 a case or whatever, you know, money matters, but you know, your vision matters more. And I've had very, very few patients that can't afford the femto. Even poor people can afford femtos. They find money from, so they, you know, often they come in and say, well, do my cataracts. I'm flying to India for two months, you know, next month. They had to buy a ticket. You know, that wasn't free either. So I don't think that that the money is really uh, a huge obstacle. We live in one of the richest countries in the world, and there aren't many people who really can't afford it. Admittedly, there are some that probably can't, and so they don't want to have Femto. The same thing as if you go to India, you see that very, very slowly, all those places doing small incision cataract surgery are closing, and they're all doing FACOs inside of um, uh, various hospitals. All those cataract camps are basically already closed. And now they do the small incision cataract surgery in someone's operating room somewhere. Uh, because as they get more money and more affluent, they're going to want to do things better. So and I think it's the same for this. We had the same complaint with FACOs. They were thought to be way too expensive in 1980. Why should we buy them? Now everybody has them. That's just the way the world goes. Thank you, Steve. So we could carry on all day with this. Um, Steve and I have had many conversations about all these topics, OVDs, uh, bilateral surgery. I thank you for all the effort that you make in this in these spaces. You, you really drive our profession forward. So Steve, it's an honor to have you as part of our Grand Rounds. Thank you for making the effort today. And I look forward to your next Grand Rounds with us uh, in, in the future. Alan and Marco, great job, guys. So we'll wrap up for today and I'll see everyone next week for, for Grand Rounds. Enjoy your Friday. Yeah. Thanks, Amandeep, and thanks, Marco and Ellen, for your hard work. Very good. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. Okay. Thanks. thanks for the questions, Alan. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. It's been great. All right. Bye-bye.